Continuing right hand turn, 290. <laughs> Arnett 2, Judy, 290, 20, 15,000. Arnett 2, clear to fire. Fox, Fox, Fox. Honey Fox, Tally Ho, and good. Did you take the missile shot? You betcha. That's gorgeous. Force attack is 080, maintain angles 19. Right on 5, band of bandit, clear to fire. Right on 5, clear to fire. Copy. Station 03, green target. Fox, Fox, Fox. Very good, very good. Good. Aces 1, knock it off. Mike, you're out of control. Piper, it up. Clear to go. Drone is clear. I got it. Go like that. Keep the ASP on. Welcome to William Tell, training for war. Fasten your seatbelt and get ready to ride in a $36 million aircraft, the F-15. This high-tech jet is touted as the Cadillac of the sky. You'll be looking over the shoulder of the best United States Air Force fighter pilots as they push the edge of the envelope in air-to-air -air battles to prove who's top gun. It's a front row seat for live missile fires, gun raids, and drone kills. It's the closest thing to war in peacetime. You can call war games. Shooting it out at Tyndall Air Force Base off the Gulf of Mexico will be the best of the best. Twelve teams of fighter pilots, air controllers, weapons loaders, and maintenance crews have flown in from American bases around the world, from Japan, Germany, Iceland, Canada, Alaska, Florida, New Mexico, Virginia, Texas, New York, Georgia, and Oregon. They're all here to prove who's the best shooter in the land. This billion dollar exercise, which takes place over a two week period, was nicknamed after William Tell, a famous Swiss archer whose story symbolizes man's willingness to struggle for freedom at all costs. For American pilots who defend freedom in the world's most dangerous job, the William Tell competition is the only place where they can push their skills to the limit. The William Tell exercise began in 1954 and was suspended only in the late 1960s during the Vietnam War. I got a sub right in front of me, a boat out there. I want to make all around this place. Come on up here. Come on, Mike. We're going to strike. Come on. Woo-hoo! Look at the mix. She's got two of them coming in on me. Come on, I need a little bit of help. Just two a little bit. Come here, the Russian analysis. Roger, I'm going. Two four zero, right on the deck. Two four zero, right on the deck. I'm getting hit four times, I think. I got cannonballs going all around me. Come on, get up out of there, Detroit. I can't. I got a whole bunch of them behind me. Okay, it's not deadly. During Vietnam, the Air Force kill ratio was a dismal two to one, an unacceptably high price in American lives. During the Korean conflict 15 years earlier, the Air Force kill ratio had been 10 to 1. In the early days of the Vietnam War, our jets didn't even have guns, since it was thought that all dogfighting would be done by missiles fired at great distances. But our pilots found out soon enough that North Vietnamese MiGs would get too close for comfort. 28 Air Force planes were killed by totally undetected enemy fighters. On top of the fact that the MiGs were fighting close in, Air Force pilots discovered that 65% of their Sparrow missiles and 45% of their Sidewinders malfunctioned due to failures in launching, guidance, or fuses. The Air Force even shot down a couple of its own. Visual identification had to be improved to confirm bogeys on radar were actually oncoming enemy aircraft. Losing so many brave young pilots taught us a tough lesson we had to concentrate as much on improving the man who flies the plane as we did on improving the speed and the killing power of our jets and missiles. 
before Vietnam, aggressive air-to-air -air training had been minimal for pilots because maneuvering two large, expensive fighting machines in the same airspace was considered dangerous. That kind of thinking had to change. In 1972, near the end of the war in Southeast Asia, the U.S. Tactical Air Command was formed at Nellis Air Base, Nevada, to give pilots more realistic combat training. Through daily dogfights, we developed better combat pilots and nearly eliminated airborne collisions. This new hard-nosed approach to pilot training brought about by the harsh lessons of Vietnam is why the Air Force tries to give its pilots the most realistic combat environment it can possibly simulate. And that's why William Tell is today's ultimate challenge of a fighter pilot's ability. Hey, I want to be the best, and there's a real good reason I want to be the best. Because obviously this is one competition where if you come in second, you don't come in at all. These modern-day Red Barons are molded and trained for a price tag of $6 million each. You'll meet men like Hoover, Slam, Flat Black, John Boy, Tex, Bo, and other American defenders who are here at William Tell where the Air Force determines which one of these throttle jockeys will rule the sky as America's top gun. Find out which one of the 12 American teams will claim victory in this military exercise. We're going to win. Okay. We're going to win it. Eglin is certainly a clear favorite to win. We'd like to win, of course. If we don't, it's going to be because we did the best we could and they're chasing us. If somebody beats us, they're a better team. William Tell, which is training for war, is not taken lightly. The purpose of William Tell is to uh, convince the people of America that they indeed do have a fine defense. And the second reason would be to uh, instill a little fear in the Soviets. I'm sure they're reporting back to Moscow intimidated. At this competition, Soviet fighter tactics are simulated by staged hostile aircraft. These same attack maneuvers are taught to enemy fighters around the communist world. Here, our pilots practice split-second responses to enemy warriors. This experience will help our pilots survive in future combat. Our actual prep preparation started uh, 10 months before the competition. And to pick our team, the first thing we picked was our coach or team leader. He then went out and flew with a very best pilot, recommended uh, who he wanted on his team. It's very important that we focused on team members and not individuals, five individuals trying to compete by themselves. Likewise, we picked the most uh, versatile and motivated. Many volunteer, but only the best of the best get a chance to come and compete. I have never worked harder in my life. It's uh, 16 hours a day and most of the time six days a week. And it's, it's an amazing amount of work that goes into preparing a jet that uh, is your basic standard F-15 and turning it into not only a, a showpiece, but also uh, probably the finest fighting aircraft. In regular training missions, pilots rarely get to fly live sorties. During William Tell, real weapons, such as the deadly Sparrow, a radar homing all-weather missile, and the effective Sidewinder, a close-range infrared missile, will be fired. The missiles cost between $50,000 and $150,000 each. These weapons will aim at the Air Force's first supersonic plane, the F-100, last used during the Vietnam War. This remote-controlled drone has special heat-generating devices placed on the wings to attract the missiles away from the jet engine and fuselage. Hopefully, the drone can then be used more than once as a target. We've had our three months of practice, four months of practice, and it's, time, it's game time. Let's get into, uh, get the game face on. The hottest pilots from the top squadrons in the entire United States Air Force are here to fly five events, or profiles. Profile 5 requires two pilots to intercept four incoming bogeys. Profile 4 is a team event, pitting four pilots in a squadron against 16 aggressors. In Profile 3, a pilot makes two passes at a towed target, blasting away with 20-millimeter guns. For Profile 2, each pilot flies one-on-one, -on -one, making a pass at a remotely piloted drone with a heat-seeking missile. In Profile 1, pilots take a single shot with a radar-guided missile. 
the Profile 5 is the air superiority mission. Okay, this mission starts out different because the actual mission starts on the ground. Okay, the pilots are staged on a, air, on a taxiway at Tyndall, and they're waiting for a horn to sound in which they will scramble to their aircraft, and they have five minutes to get the aircraft ready, taxi out at the fights on call. They have a five-minute time limit to kill four adversary aircraft, and that's, that's all part of, the, of how we do our business. Chase planes would only confuse the skies, so for Profile 5, the scores are kept on a computer in the Combat Control Center. Here, in real time on a large screen, radar echoes display what's happening in the skies over Tyndall Air Force Base. Two defending planes in red at the top of the screen are attacking two green targets, the aggressor aircraft. The first one fires a simulated radar missile and scores. The second immediately fires a missile on his target, sending the bogey to a coffin box. One more bites the dust. Profile 4 puts four, the four team members, uh, against a mass raid type scenario. Now, a big part of the mass raid scenario is, of course, the ground-based controller. He's a vital part of the team. But his information that gets the pilots or the air crews airborne looking in the direction of the threat uh, and be able to target each one of those aircraft. Now, once they target them, just because they lock them up on the radar and they employ their weapons doesn't mean that, that that's good for them. They must identify that aircraft as a hostile aircraft in which they go in there and try to kill that target or make sure that it's not a friendly aircraft and they don't kill that. 16 targets, only four kills allowed per team member, so each team member has to do his part. In a real war, this would be a defensive fight, where you're knocking down the adversaries before they can attack your flight line or even your home city. The mass raid, the Profile 4 mass raid, which is what I judge, and Profile 5, the air defense scramble, where you go two against four target, hostile targets, uh, are probably the most subjective of the uh, five, and certainly that's where the scores are really up to the pilots. And uh, the, the teams that I think do best on those, if they can get good missiles, they can probably come away with the top score. Profile 3, the uh, employment of the, uh, the gun off of the aircraft, against the aerial gunnery target set, a target that is towed behind an F-15. Okay, and it's about a 1,500-foot cable, okay, and this is reeled out once they uh, reach the overwater range. And the objective in, in this is for the first shooter to maneuver his aircraft in for what we call a snapshot, basically to put bullets out there and attempt to get a hit on the, uh, the target set. Okay, a 55-second time limit, he has to do that in minimum time. Whatever time is left, after the first shooter tries to get his snapshot, then the other shooter will maneuver and he is cleared to fire for a tracking shot. This event is a classic traditional test of a pilot's gunnery precision. The reason pilots are required to get their shots off quickly is to match real combat conditions where speed is life. I say this is the hardest because now we're, we're talking about very, very high G loading placed on the pilot a lot of switchology that must take place in the cockpit to put him in a position to employ uh, the gun. During these tight turns, the pilot experiences anywhere up to nine times the force of gravity. A 200-pound man now weighs close to 2,000 pounds. After completing three profiles, Bitburg, Germany, the 36th Fighter Interceptor Group, the Nomads of the 33 Tactical Fighter Wing from Eglin Air Base, and finally, the Zunis of Holloman Air Base in New Mexico are all in a dead heat for Top Gun honors. The final two profiles, which are flown back to back, will determine the winner. The Air Force's Top Gun, tomorrow's ace.
you feel the tension build as we got here the tension wasn't as heavy and now as the scores have started to come out the tension is building and each pilot's getting a little more tense and we'll all be glad when it's over but we're all going to hope that it when it's over that we're the winners seven seven and six and a half five and a half should be faster now five Fox, Fox, Fox. Pilot one, Charlie Ho, engage. Copy. Tell me to go ahead. Now. Go ahead. You're looking through a heads-up display, or HUD, which is the pilot's Bible. Flight instruments and weapons systems are projected on a clear screen in front of the pilot. This eliminates his need to look down at his instruments during the heat of battle. You will typically see altitude readings on the right. Lower left is airspeed, displayed as a percentage of Mach speed. Below that is a four-digit readout of the number of Gs the aircraft is pulling in a turn. These lines represent an artificial horizon line, and magnetic compass headings are displayed across the middle of the screen. When a square box appears, the fighter has engaged his target. You'll hear the ground controller, the fighter pilot, and the chase plane's pilot talking while you watch from the chase plane's point of view. Profile one, live missile fire, the AIM-7 Sparrow, single missile against the uh, QF-100 drone. The, the informant begins at about 40 mile range in which the uh, pilot have to find the target on the radar. Uh, they identify the target and uh, make sure that they have the, the correct target, and they will employ the AIM-7 against us. Now, this is a live missile. It does not have a warhead on board, but it does have a telemetry package on board the missile, which they can get positive feedback as to how close it actually comes to, uh, to the drone. Got it. One, two, Sally Ho, engage. Ace is one copy. Once the live missile fire of the AIM-7 uh, has taken place, then the drone will continue its present heading until the uh, fighter and the uh, drone meet. And once they cross place what we call a 3-9 line, the drone goes into a turn. Then the pilot or air crew has a minimum time to employ the AIM-9 heat-seeking missile against the drone. You can see that some of these shots come very quickly. The last two events begin with the takeoff of an F-100 jet, a Super Sabre fighter from Vietnam days. Originally, these jets cost more than $10 million to build. They're capable of speeds of more than 800 miles an hour, and during the Vietnam Air War, they usually carried cannons as well as missiles. But today, they're not shooting back. The Super Sabre pilots actually sit comfortably on the ground at Tyndall Air Base and can concentrate on combat without any high-altitude distractions. Now, it's showtime. The pilot with the hottest hand and lady luck behind him will be Top Gun. In profiles one and two, a squadron puts four fighters in the air. Each pilot then gets two shots at the drone. The first, a head-on radar missile shot. The second, a heat-seeking missile chasing the target. The team with the best overall score from the squadron's eight missile shots wins this profile. Listen for ground controllers to give a clear-to-fire call. Pilots will call Fox, 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 when they launch their missiles. First to shoot is Shogun, pilot two, that's Captain Christopher Rich. After the first missile fires, the drone is turned. Each fighter then rolls around and chases the enemy target from behind. The QF-100 drone is hit, left paralyzed in a spin. 
Onboard detonator will destroy the wounded plane. Like to shoot. Aces 100 crest green target. Okay, they have the uh, drone here out of control. Aces 11 is going to shoot the target. Request green target. You can see the uh, QF 100 in his spin okay, going down. Request green target. Negative. Negative. Stand by. Blow the drone. Blow it up. Blow it up. UHF destruct on my mark. Three, two, one. Four. Back in the sky with a new drone target, one of George's finest, Captain Stephen Schmidt, call sign Peach 4, is now ready to try his hand. Toward the ground, toward the ground. Right now, clear the fire. Drone is turning. It's close, but George's turtle score will come up short. They are out of the running for Top Gun. The Claw, Captain Gregory Classen from Langley Air Force Base, now tries to see if he's got the right stuff. Turn the drone. I'm at PSD. Turn the drone, turn the drone. Freedom, freedom. Freedom, clear the fire. Again, another good shot. Aces three, knock it off. Freedom three, knock it off. Arm safe. Post attack vector zero seven zero. Requested battle damage check one two eight. Over on three zero eight nine. You can see that the uh, aft portion of the QF one hundred uh, was hit by the missile. So she does get damage to both the. Uh, Exhaust area of the, the upper tail of the aircraft. Negative, it looks like the we got a hurt drone here. We're gonna stay with the drone. This is extra ammo burner to keep it flying. Okay, the tail end is heating up red hot. You're out of burner. Three, you'll need to turn the drone right to 160. Understand it's not recoverable. Request green target. Negative, negative, stand by. Blow the drone, blow it up, blow it up. UHF destruct on my mark. Three, two, one, mark. No destruct, no destruct. Request green target. Okay. Negative, negative green target. Another shooter is five miles north. It just went. In spite of the high G-load experienced in Profiles 1 and 2, today's pilots have already killed two drones. In this William Tell, our boys have downed more target aircraft than ever before. Practice, camaraderie, and teamwork pays off. Individuals can't carry a unit. It's going to take all of them working together. They work as a team. That's the way we train. And that's the way you're going to keep them dying in combat and win a fight out there, too. Trying next to win is Captain James Demarest of Bitburg. Time has expired. The missile was ruled by the judges as pilot or ground crew maintenance error. That blows Bitburg's chances to win the competition. Uh, the live missile shots, you're more dependent on the, uh, the missile itself, you know, how it's going to perform. It's happened to several other units that have had uh, missile problems uh, or associated missile problems and, and weren't ready to refly, and that's, that's a lot of points. So all you can do is your best, and uh, we've trained to do that. With 90% of the sorties flown, only Eglin and Holloman are left to fight it out. The pressure is on. Who will rise to the occasion? The most intense pressure I've ever been under in my 14 and a half years in the Air Force, uh, bar none. Uh, and I've 
including pilot training and RTU and fighter weapon school, uh, this, this was absolutely most intense. How my next missile does, it's going to weigh heavily on how we determine. So the pressure is there when you're on the ground thinking about it during the briefing and during the day when you just keep trying to think what could go wrong and, and trying to eliminate those problems. The pressure on the defending champs all rides on the shoulders of the last pilot, Scott Fashholz. He knows he's got a chance for Top Gun, but even more important is the fate of the team. With Fashholz, Eglin is odds-on favorite. He outscored everyone in Profile 3, the precision gun competition, winning the Top Shooter Award. When you get up in the airplane, you sit there for about five minutes. Now's the time to kind of hopefully sit there and kind of relax and uh, go through the mission in your mind again. You kind of replay it through your mind over and over again so uh, all the little things hopefully have been fresh in your mind. You can go out and they'll happen this way. You kind of picture them happening. You know what the required communications calls are, what the setup's probably going to be like, where the sun might be in case it's going to be a factor for uh, taking a heat shot. Uh, once you get started, man, it's basically on your own. Eglin is flying the newest F-15 in the Air Force fleet, the Model E. With the newest technology on board, this jet has the ultimate radar system, but a simplified cockpit. Flying the top of the line, can Eglin make it three in a row? As Nomad 3 takes off high in the sky to defend his squadron's title, his team anxiously waits and listens. He's smart. He knows what he's doing. Will the target elude him? Takes his first shot. It's good. Start the drone. Turn the drone. Drone is turning. Twenty-five seconds. Twenty seconds. Fifteen seconds. Time is running out. Over and over, Fashholz tries to get his missile to come off the rack. It won't engage. The Eglin team sits in disappointment. They know what outfit they can set. I don't know what was happening there, but it just tends to make things go, uh, not go smoothly when you do things out of your habit patterns get all trash. Well, when I engaged him, I ruled out it didn't sound like a very quality tone. Yeah. 
and so I didn't shoot it then. And I went around, backed off, and came back and pointed at him again to take it. And this time it had uh, no no self track capability at all. So I figured if it was going to do anything, it was going to go after a shark, and I'd just bring it home. Yeah, we'll check it out. Stunned by the missile misfire, Eglin must wait for the judge's decision. Will their pilot get another shot? Meanwhile, Holloman Air Force Base has a chance to come in the back door, pushing Eglin off the throne. With just two profiles left to fly, will the Ghost Riders rule the sky? The boys from out west fly the A-model F-15. It is the oldest F-15 originally built in the 1970s. But Holloman Zuni warriors know it's not an airplane versus an airplane, but pilot versus pilot. They are the last team to fly profile one and two. The thrill of victory or the agony of defeat lies in their hands along with the Holloman team. Ted Varwig is in hot pursuit of the Top Gun title. Before takeoff, one of the Ghost Riders, Captain Ted Varwig, discovers he's got a cold missile. To keep the team in the competition, he calls for the squadron's spare fighter to take his place. He'll miss the final flight. Back on the ground, Varwig replaces his missile with a good one just in case. It happens. Zuni 4 discovers he's carrying a dog. There is still time to swap places in the sky. Varwig is off. He will get a second chance. Can he keep his cool? Will the missile launch? Zuni 3 shoots. Fox, Fox, Fox. Zuni 3, Taliban gate. A perfect shot. He aced it. Fox, Fox, Fox. With that shot, Teddy Varwig wins the Air Force's Top Gun. How did he do it? Profile 1 and 2, where we went fired the live AIM-7s and AIM-9s, or our radar missiles and our heat missiles. When I initially cranked up, I had a bad uh, telemetry pack which tracks the missile. So uh, the spare pilot went out, and at that time I shut down and they loaded, the maintenance guys came out and loaded another air, uh, missile, and I became the spare pilot. So uh, they were out uh, number three and, excuse me, number four, and the spare pilot took off. And as soon as we got airborne, I think the most important decision made and helped us win this thing was uh, our number four, four pilot had a bad, bad aim nine, much like the guy at Eglin. And he called right then and said, hey, launch the spare. So I got launched. And it was that teamwork from maintenance, the pilot's ego shoved aside that went out there and said, hey, we're out there to win this thing. We're not out here for an individual award. Without that teamwork of guys downloading the missile in, in 10 minutes and uploading a new one and me getting airborne and all the, the GCI work and stuff, there was, you know, we couldn't have done it. For the 1,500 participants, the two weeks of war at William Tell are over. An unprecedented total of 10 drones have been killed. For Eglin, the judges rule that Captain Fashholt's missile was operational, pointing to pilot or ground crew error. No points for Fashholt's flight. The disappointed nomads finish sixth. With the help of Barwig and all their pilots, it's the Ghost Riders in the sky who win William Tell. Like, yeah, we can go out and we can win anywhere, you know? I mean, it doesn't matter where we go, whether it's real war or just competition, we can go and we can win. Captain Ted Varwig, John Boy, takes home the individual Top Gun trophy, having aced three of the five profiles. His final two missile shots were textbook examples of precision flying and teamwork.
You have flown with the best. For two weeks, these pilots have gone head to head and found out who's on top. But here at William Tell, there are no losers. Fortunately, all the teams in this competition are all uh, on the same side. And when we go to war tomorrow or next year or in five years, we're all going to be fighting for the same cause, and that's the American freedom and the democratic process. So when we lose to our colleagues from Kadena, Japan, or Bitburg, Germany, it's no real loss to the United States and our Air Force. It's a, really a victory for all of it. Do you have what it takes to do their job?